recording. Hi everyone, I'm Carol Sherriott, and I wanna thank you for coming and attending our second online community, community meeting for the De La Cruz Boulevard Coleman Avenue bikeway planning study. Next slide. Um, as I said, I am Carol Sherriott, and I am the Principal Transportation Planner with the City of Santa Clara, and I'm also the Project Manager for this project. Um, we have a couple other city staff that are involved in this project. Uh, we have Michael Liu, our Assistant Public Works Director. We have Steve Chan, our Transportation Manager. Uh, we have Ralph Garcia, our Senior Civil Engineer. And then we have our consultants, Kimley Horn, who are helping us um, with this plan. So we have Naomi Willis and we have Adam Dankberg. Next slide. So what are we gonna be discussing today? Uh, first, we wanna go over the project schedule and the goals of the project. Then we wanna go over what the st study area is today and what it looks like. We also want to go over any um, the outreach efforts that we've done to date and some of the feedback that we've gotten from the outreach that, that we've been doing. And then we want to uh, look at existing conditions of the project corridor. We'll uh, give the results of the collision analysis that was done for the project as well as the parking analysis. And then, of course, the real meat of this project is to present to you all the draft design concepts and alternatives that we've developed for the corridor. And then finally, uh, we'll go over next steps and then how you can stay involved in the project. Next slide. And then with that, I'm going to turn it over to Naomi. Thank you so much, Carol, and welcome everybody to this second community meeting and workshop for this project. We're really excited to be here today to talk about this project and its future. Um, and just kick that off, as Carol mentioned, we'll be going over the project schedule and goals. So right now we are in the community outreach round two. So this project is spanning from through 2023 and into the first half of 2024. Throughout this process, we're starting by gathering information and public input, so and gathering public input. So this is what we completed with our first round of outreach. Um, what we've most recently been working through is developing and sharing, um, developing our concept of alternatives, which we're excited to share today. For our next round of outreach, we'll be selecting a preferred alternative based on the feedback that we received during this round of outreach. Um, we'll then prepare a final project report and submit the pro final project report to City Council for their review. Our project study area is primarily along De La Cruz Boulevard from Central Expressway through the Tri-Level and over to Lafayette Street and along Coleman Avenue from the Tri-Level to Brokaw Road. We wanna highlight that at the Northern end of this project at Central Expressway, We'll be connecting to the VTA US 101 Trimble Road Interchange Project. So this is really a great continuation of the work that's happening there and we'll um, just continue to provide bike connectivity through the community. So the key project goals are to install class four bike lanes on De La Cruz and Coleman. And to clarify, a class four bikeway is a bikeway that provides a physical vertical separation element between motor vehicle traffic and the bike lane. Examples of this type of separation could be plastic posts, bollards, medians, planters, or raised bumps. Um, class four bike lanes are also referred to as separated bikeways, protected bike lanes, and cycle tracks. So a lot of those terms are used interchangeably in this context, um, but just wanted to provide a little bit of background to that. We'd also like to highlight that our project goal is to install class four bike lanes because of the vehicle speeds and volumes along the corridor. When the bike plan was originally developed, it called for class two bike lanes on Coleman Road from Reed Street to Aviation Avenue. 
However, as we've discovered through additional study, class four bike weights would be more appropriate for the corridor context due to those vehicle speeds and volumes. Our project goals are also to create the streets for everyone, no matter who they are or how they choose to travel, to provide convenient, comfortable, and connected transportation choices. And we understand that understanding the context and community character are essential for creating a successful, meaningful project. So the plan process, we touched on this briefly in our schedule slide, but phase one is information gathering and community survey. Phase two is developing and sharing concept alternatives. Phase three is identifying a preferred alternative. And phase four is city council review and consideration. We'll touch briefly on the study area today now. So today, De La Cruz Boulevard and Coleman Avenue are mostly six lane roadways with a 45 or 40 mile per hour speed limit. They intersect at the tri-level, which is a series of overlapping structures um, that connect the three pieces of the roadway. A really complicated area, as I'm sure you are all aware of. This corridor and this project area is a really key part of the city's infrastructure and the region's infrastructure. It's near the BART Santa Clara station, right ne next to the San Jose airport, and it's near other key community destinations. Our adjacent land use is mostly industrial and commercial. Um, and related to that, there is on-street parking available along portions of the corridor. We'll talk more about that later today. There are no existing bike facilities along the study area. These are just a few photos highlighting uh, what the corridor looks like today. So as you can see, it's very much vehicle focused, uh, very wide roads, high speeds. Um, fast drivers, and it's not friendly for people who are using more active forms of transportation. We also wanna take a moment to highlight the existing and planned bike network around the project corridor. So there's a lot of exciting things going on in the city and in this area in particular. So we have the US 101 North or US 101 De La Cruz Trimble Road Interchange that we discussed previously at the northern end of the corridor. We have the Gateways Crossings Project, which would construct class two bike lanes on Brokaw and Coleman south of the corridor. There's also the Santa Clara Station Focus Area Plan that is in progress. And so that's looking at the area around that Santa Clara BART station to see what types of improvements they can do to improve that last mile connection um, and what the future of the area might look like. So that's also in the works. We have the Walsh Martin Class 4 Bike Study, which is in planning. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces and lots of exciting things for this corridor specifically to connect to. So this won't just be a standalone project. It connects to other regional um, and local projects that are happening. We'll touch briefly on our outreach efforts to date. So there's a project website, as hopefully you've all had a chance to visit. Um, this project website has information for this project as well as the other projects that are in planning and design right now. Um, as part of our first phase of outreach, we also completed an online survey, or uh, had an online survey. Um, through this online survey, we had 63 respondents answer. So we got a lot of great feedback on the corridor and people's experiences with the corridor today. We also had a pop-up booth at the Bike to Wherever Days and the Art and Wine Festival. So we've been trying to seek out feedback um, where people are at and getting more feedback in that way. Additionally, we installed roadside signs to give people a chance to find out more about the project, especially people who are already using the corridor, as well as sent out over a thousand postcards uh, during the before the phase one community meeting and before this meeting to try and get the word out there about the project. We have a voice line available so people can call and leave a message. We have not received any messages so far, but that is available for people who would prefer to talk as opposed to email, as well as an email address. And we've received two emails so far. Uh, our first community meeting was conducted on May 22nd and we had seven members participate. We discussed the project purpose, approach, scope of work and community vision. 
And one of the key pieces of feedback we heard was that most attendees said they would ride through the area at least a few times a month or more if there was better bike facilities. There is also a few key themes that we heard through our Q&A and feedback portion of that community meeting, as well as through a live poll that we did throughout the meeting. So some of the key feedback was that traffic volumes or traffic is really fast through the project corridor. Um, and so the community is interested in ways to make it less fast um, or provide traffic calming. Um, there was questions about how this project integrates with neighboring projects around the study area. Um, and so just in response to that, we are really working closely with all these other projects and finding ways that we can integrate with them better. So I think it's exciting to see what's in store for this area. Um, improving bike access uh, to different community facilities and destinations, as well as prioritizing safety as being a key uh, consideration. Our online survey was available from March to June, and we, as I mentioned, had 63 responses. The questions highlighted relationships to corridor, what types of improvements community members wanted to see, and allowed for open-ended comments. Most respondents, 71%, said they would ride through the area at least a few times a month or more with better bike facilities. I'd also like to highlight um, the most important improvements that the responses the respondents noted were continuous bike lanes and bike lanes that are physically protected from cars. So everyone who responded to their survey um, seemed to recognize that those would really improve the bikeability of this portion of the community. Throughout the survey and the open-ended questions, um, one of the key pieces we heard is that many people currently avoid biking in the study area because it feels unsafe, uncomfortable, and hostile. Um, so looking for ways as we move this project forward to help change that narrative and make biking feel something like something that can be safe and comfortable for everyone. Um, many people also noted that only a bike with physical protection would help them feel comfortable using the corridor. So this was a key consideration for us. I'll talk briefly on the collision analysis now. So we reviewed five years of collision data along this corridor um, and throughout the project area. So there was 89 collisions reported between 2018 and 2022. There were no fatalities or severe injuries that were reported, um, which is good news. Um, however, there were two bike collisions and one pedestrian collision. We think part of the reason um, why the pet and bike collisions were maybe lower than you might expect based on some of the hostile feedback we've gotten about the corridor is because there are low pet and bike volumes there today because we're lacking the facilities. I'd also like to know um, about 64% of collisions were property damage only, um, and then the other 36% of collisions involved an injury. Um, most of the collisions occurred within 250 feet of an intersection. Um, so we like to think of those as intersection collisions. And so a lot of those are just related to how people are interacting at that intersection. Um, and then the intersections with the most collisions were De La Cruz Boulevard at Central Expressway, which aligns with the types of volumes we see there. And then Central Express and um, at Martin Avenue. And the roadway segments with the most collisions were along the tri-level. The primary collision cause was improper, or sorry, excuse me, the primary collision cause was unsafe speed followed by improper turning. Then the third most frequent cause was traffic signals and signs and violations of those. So the speeding, those comments that we received are really in line with the feedback that we are getting um, or the comments we received are in line with the collision data that we're seeing for the corridor. And here is a map of the collision. So the size of the gray bubble represents uh, how many collisions are there. So you can see there's really uh, spikes and collisions at some of those intersections. Uh, 
Um, I'd also like to note, um, I think this might have come up in the chat, that we'll be enabling Q&A in the raise hand function once the presentation is over, um, and then we'll open the floor for questions. So this is our parking inventory. So we collected parking data along the project area as well as side streets for 500 feet on each side across the span of a week. So we collected data every 30 minutes for seven days straight to really get an understanding of how is parking utilized along this corridor. We also collected a parking inventory. So we wanted to see how many spaces are there along this corridor and the side streets today. So there's about 493 on-street parking spaces. Of those, 193 are along the project corridor, De La Cruz and Coleman, and 300 are on adjacent side streets. The parking occupancy. So this slide illustrates the parking occupancy during the peak weekday peak hour. So we looked at all the data we collected and we wanted to see which hour did parking tend to be the highest along the corridor. And that was from one to 2 p.m. average on weekdays. And so as you can see through this, um, there's a lot of stretches of this corridor that are in green, blue, and yellow. And those are stretches where parking is really just underutilized and not highly valued. So you can see north of Martin Avenue um, and just south of it, De La Cruz has parking occupancy between zero to 40%. So very low volumes along this uh, corridor and then some higher volumes on some of the side streets during this peak hour. So on average, about 25% of parking spaces were utilized during weekdays. So looking at all of the weekdays, um, which showed higher parking than the weekends, it was about 25%. And then during that peak hour, it was about 33%. If we look at just De La Cruz Boulevard only, um, there's no actual parking on Coleman Avenue. So for De La Cruz only, we're looking at 9% on average during weekdays and then 13% during that peak hour. We also took a look at the parking inventory and broke it down a little bit more. So looking at De La Cruz on the west side and the east side, and then the side streets on the west side and the east side. And so these first two, um, the middle two columns right here, weekday out, weekday peak hour parking occupancy and weekday peak hour utilization. Those illustrate um, that exhibit that we just showed you. So about 33% utilization on average for the full study area on weekdays during that peak hour. We also wanted to put this system to the limit and see what's the most parking that was observed over that one week. And so what we did is we took every single little segment and we saw what was the most number of cars observed parked on that segment and we compiled that. So this maximum occupancy during week is looking at the whole week, what is the maximum number of cars parked on any one segment? Um, and with that, we see a max utilization of about 55% on average for the whole study area. And you can see it's a lot lower um, around like 20 something percent for the project corridor only. What this illustrates is that parking really is underutilized, especially on De La Cruz and Coleman. Um, and even if select portions of parking were removed along De La Cruz and Coleman, there's other parking nearby um, that can help substitute um, if there was any parking repurposing along the corridor. And so just wanna show some of the background of the study. Um, and what parking is looking like. Um, we do have some different alternatives, but just wanna highlight what we saw in the field was that it was largely underutilized on the corridor, mostly because it's not the most comfortable place to park. Um, and then this is just a graph that shows parking occupancy and utilization over the course of the day on average. So the orange is the weekday average. So you can see we get up to that 33% or so. And then the blue is the weekend average, so a little lower. And then this is looking at De La Cruz Boulevard only. So the weekday average hovers just over 10% and the weekend average is less than 10%. So with that, um, we wanna take just a moment and do a live survey. And so what this live survey is, 
it's just a one question poll. Um, you can go ahead and scan the QR code from your phone, or if you're using your computer, you can go to wooclap.com. Um, and could we actually open up Q&A at this point, just to make sure if anybody's having trouble accessing the survey, um, that we have an opportunity to hear from them? And so um, the slide survey is just one question, but what we are looking for is we wanna hear from you. Um, how are you connected to this corridor? What does this corridor mean to you? And so you should be um, directed to the WooCloud website. And you can follow the directions on the screen in order to um, provide your thoughts. We'll give people just a couple more minutes to respond. Um, and the question, this is a question that's on the online survey as well. So don't feel, um, if you're having technical difficulties, no worries, we can get this information from you in another way. Um, it's just what describes your connection to this area. We would just love to find out more about how you're connected here to make sure that um, we're serving you and trying to reach everyone that we can along the corridor. All right. So with that, our results are in. Um, I think we'll call this a good time. Uh, and so I'll just uh, verbally talk through the results. They're pretty quick and easy. So six participants or 75% noted that they, excuse me, travel through the corridor with a destination outside of the area. Two participants noted that they work or volunteer along or near the area. And 25% uh, or two participants noted that they shop or visit social or recreational destinations along or near the project area. So thank you all so much for your feedback. Um, it looks like we got a good chunk of everyone on here, but I really appreciate hearing from you. So with that, we're going to dive into the funnest part of this night um, and talk through some of our design concepts that we're working through. So how this project is set up is we'll be showing cross sections uh, for each portion of the corridor. And so these cross sections are broken down into five different locations. And these locations were chosen because for a long stretch of the project corridor, it all looks really similar. And so you can see we have five sections. So section one is just south of Central Expressway, section two, just north of Martin, section three, between Reed and Martin. Section four is through the tri-level um, along Pullman Avenue. And section five is just north of Brokaw Road. In general, we have two concepts that we'll be presenting. So concept A includes class four cycle tracks, um, so protected bike lane on each side of De La Cruz between Central and Reed, and then a two-way cycle track on the east side of Coleman, south of Reed. Concept B includes a two-way cycle track along the west side of De La Cruz between Central and Martin, class four cycle tracks on each side of De La Cruz between Martin and Reed, and a two-way cycle track on the east side of Coleman. And we'll start to illustrate this in just a second, but just wanted to give a high level overview of the differences. And the main difference is between the stretch between um, Martin and Central Expressway. This is also illustrated at a high level on this exhibit. I know this one's a little bit hard to read on the slide, but it's also um, should be available on the project website. And so just wanted to highlight the project area that we'll be working through. It's along Coleman and De La Cruz. Um, this also helps illustrate how we're connecting to all these other bike projects in the area. So exciting things coming through. 
So starting with section one, so this is our northernmost section. On the screen, you can see our existing conditions outlined in orange, and then our proposed concept A outlined in light blue. And so we'll have two concepts for section one. You can see today there's six travel lanes in each direction, or sorry, three travel lanes in each direction, six travel lanes total. We have parking on the west side of the road, as well as a sidewalk on the west side of the road. On the east side of the road, we have a shoulder, and then it's adjacent to the airport property. Proposed concept A takes the parking lane on the west side and the shoulder on the east side and converts them into bike facilities. These bike facilities would have some form of protection. Um, that form of protection would be determined in a future design phase, but some vertical separation element between people biking and people driving. And it maintains the same number of travel lanes as well as protecting in place the center median. <clears throat> concept B, so again, we have just the existing conditions up top and then concept B you can see is our alternative proposal. And this includes a two-way cycle track on the west side of De La Cruz. So with this two-way cycle track, um, this would tie into the US 101 Trimble Interchange as they're also proposing a two-way cycle track or shared use path on the west side. Um, a couple other key notes between concept A and concept B. So most of the land uses today are on the west side of the street. Con um, on the east side, it's just the airport frontage. And so there's not a lot of adjacent places that you can bike to. Um, ultimately, people biking will want to end up on that west side to access the uh, interchange bike path. Um, so just a couple of key notes to highlight. However, um, one thing to note with concept B with this two-way is there is a little bit more lane narrowing proposed currently um, in order to protect and place the median, the travel lanes and the bike facilities are a little narrower. Moving south, concept two um, is just north of Martin Avenue. And this is a very similar situation. The only modification to this is the median ends um, for this section two, we just have a striped two-way left turn lane. So section two, concept A, we have um, bike lanes on each side of the street with a separation element between the bike lane and travel lanes. And then section two, concept B, we again have a two-way cycle track on the west side of the street um, and then are again maintaining the same number of travel lanes. Section three is between Martin Avenue and Reed Street. And so today um, we again have six lanes total. There is parking on each side of the street and then a large center left turn lane. Our concept A includes protected bike lanes on each side of the street going in each direction, as well as maintaining parking on the east side of the street. And we only have one alternative for this portion of the corridor. Um, we did analyze several different alternatives and we thought this was the most viable solution for this part of the corridor. Um, I would like to note we did consider continuing the two-way cycle track through this portion, but due to the number of driveways um, and the number of intersections and the street layout, we don't recommend a two-way cycle track through here. And we think that providing access to destinations on both sides of the street will better serve the community as well as provide a safer biking experience. This is section four. So this is on Coleman Avenue, kind of just east of the tri-level. So we're going from Reed Street to just south of that tri-level. And at this location um, today, there are two travel lanes as well as a shoulder and a sidewalk. We're looking at proposing to narrow those travel lanes in order to fit a two-way cycle track. Um, so this is all within the existing roadway width. Um, all of these actually are all within the existing roadway width. Um, but again, continuing to provide north-south bike travel, so going in each direction. And then finally, section five is uh, near the Costco, so just north of Brokaw Avenue to south of the uh, tri-level. And so in this section, you can see we have seven travel lanes today, plus a center turn lane, plus a shoulder, 
there's a lot of roadway width to work with. And what we're looking at doing is, I apologize, this is supposed to be a median um, technical difficulty over here. Um, but what we're looking at doing is just providing a two-way cycle track. Um, and so a two-way cycle track with protection and again, maintaining those same travel lanes and just working within the existing roadway width. We'd also like to highlight our evaluation of the tri-level. So as you saw, we are not proposing anything um, that goes westward through the tri-level as a part of these concepts. So we did a really deep dive into the tri-level today, um, and it's a really complicated, uh, difficult area to bike today um, and difficult to work with. There's um, several series of overlapping bridges, um, and there's a lot of considerations that we took into account as we make the, the decision to not propose improvements along the tri-level at this time. So overall, bike facilities implemented within the existing tri-level structure would be difficult would be uncomfortable and difficult to construct. Um, the tri-level includes a lot of high vehicle speeds and volumes. There's limited sight distance. Some roadway widths are too narrow to provide protected bike lanes. There are multiple bridge structures, large elevation changes that are difficult for a lot of people biking, um, many convergence and divergence points, and many potential conflict points between people biking and motor vehicles, especially because of those convergence and divergence points. Um, we'd also like to highlight that at this time, solutions that result in lane reductions or require extensive infrastructure improvements were not considered as part of this study. Um, they're not included as um, the grant funding scope. And so we wanted to stick with projects that were a little bit easier to get on the ground and get implemented. And so at this time, we're not moving forward with any proposed recommendations to the tri-level. Uh, because we're unable to provide a safe bike facility without major infrastructure changes. So with that, um, let's chat through your vision and next steps, and then we can get this Q&A party going. Um, so next steps, we will be presenting this project at the BPAC meeting on Monday, so upcoming October 23rd. We're going to continue our community engagement round two and present at several commissions around the city, um, continue to attend pop-up events. We'll be reviewing online survey feedback. So this survey is probably the best place to provide your feedback about this project. We'd love to hear from you. And then after we complete this process, we'll be selecting a preferred alternative based on the community feedback and analysis of the project. So here are some ways to stay involved. You can take the survey and see project updates at our website. You can send us an email. You can call and leave us a voice message and you can attend future community meetings. So thank you all so much for being here today. With that, here's a link to our community survey. So you can use the QR code and then it'll also be posted on the project's website. And I'll leave it on here for just a minute, but um, that concludes my presentation. So thank you all so much. And I would like to say, thank you, Naomi. Um, I would like to say that the survey is posted on the project webpage now. Um, so you could go ahead and go in and uh, provide feedback on all of these, um, in the two alternatives that Naomi went over today. And, um, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts on them. And um, I believe that the survey is going to be opened uh, through the end of November 29th. So you'll have some time um, to provide your feedback. Um, I think with that, I think we can get started on the Q&A. Um, I think, do we want people to raise their hands or? I see two raised hands um, if you're open to receiving questions that way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, can we go ahead and let the first person with the raised hand speak, please? Uh, 
Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Oh, mm -hmm. hi. Yeah, this hi, is Diane Harris and um, a former BPAC member. Um, and anyway, I well, my, I had a couple things, but the first one is I was deeply, deeply disappointed to not see the tri-level section being included in this uh, package. Um, I currently sometimes do go south on Dela Cruz over that overpass and on to into downtown San Jose. Um, there's a shoulder there. It's not too steep. And it would be highly improved if if it were a, a bike lane and b could have some green striping so that motorists know that bicyclists are expected there you don't have to have a class two or class four to improve that section greatly if you just put in the green paint and the bike lanes and and show people where to go and and show the motorists to expect bicycles you can get them safely through that tri-level being somebody who lives south of el camino and if I'm going to access this area, I'm going northeast. Um, I looked at the map. There is really no way to go in this project area. I would have to go all the way around. Um, generally, when I do go and I am accessing east of this of this um, Dela Cruz, I'm going either to Guadalupe uh, Trail or to uh, parts of San Jose that happen to be in that section east of the airport. So. Um, I would really like you to go back to the drawing board on that section and think about what I just said and and what other people may have said and and put in something that may be less than ideal but is better than what they've got right now. Um, and this only the only second thing is I don't think uh, two way cycle tracks in any way shape or form are a good idea because you've got the person on the outs on toward the traffic who's going against the traffic. Um, I would find that really scary. I would tend to go on the shoulder on the other side before I would go on against traffic on the two way. Um, that is, is, it's not, and, and, and I just can't even imagine how those intersections are going to look that are going to try to get people safely from a two way facility to a, a one way facility um, or, a, you know, two on one section um, safely through six lanes of traffic. I, I mean, it just seems absolutely crazy. So those are my two main points. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane, for your comments. They are noted. Um, I think Naomi or Adam, do you want to discuss a little bit about looking at, you know, actually each ramp of the tri-level and, you know, what you were finding and, you know, we, we did look at you know, at even adding class two, but I, I think because of the speeds, um, because of, you know, if, if someone breaks down on the ramp, you know, we, we had a hard time really wanting to add a bike lane on any of the ramps. Um, but if there's anything else you want to add Naomi or Adam about that would be great. Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. I can start. And um, you know, you definitely raise a lot of good points. Um, I think we, you know we spent a lot of time thinking about the trial level and how to best accommodate bike facilities through there. And we really wanted to make sure that if we're putting a bike facility and, and marking one out there, that it was truly safe and, and comfortable for riders to use. Um, you know, we don't want to put a facility out there that you know encourages people to bike, and then we see a rise in incidents and collisions and safety challenges for riders out there. So. Um, we certainly understand that at some points you may feel comfortable riding in the shoulder, um, but we really want to make sure that if we're actually designating this as a bike facility, um, that it really has that level of safety and comfort. Um, and so we did take a look at each of the ramp connections, and I'll let Naomi talk through some of the details on that. Um, but we really found that, you know, for each of those connections, there was a choke point or a constraint point or something where it would really impact the ability to use that ramp connection, um, you know, safely or comfortably. For, for most bike riders. Um, and so that led us to uh, to this point. Um, so Naomi, if you wanna dive in. Yes, thank you, Adam and Carol. Um, and thank you for your comment, Diane. So we took a really methodical, detailed, deep, deep dive into this tri-level um, and looking for solutions and ways to bring facilities, um, but Adam, as Adam mentioned, but to bring them safely. And so, uh, what we looked at was each of the different uh, directions and different movements. 
So starting with movements to and from the West, um, our biggest constraint point is this existing bridge here. Um, and so with this bridge, there is not enough width on the bridge in order to provide bike lanes um, unless you, I think at most you can get um, like a four to five foot bike lane through here due to the existing constraints, um, which we felt was not appropriate given the site distance constraints, given the speeds, um, and given what people are doing. Additionally, there are several pinch points on top of the um, narrower than recommended bike lanes. There are several pinch points for the bike lane um, in order to maintain it um, and not drop it would involve really costly improvements um, due to crash cushions and railing. And so we'd be redesigning those crash cushions and railing, which has the potential to impact portions of the bridge structure. And so um, this bridge is about 350 feet long and crosses two rail tracks. And so as a long-term improvement, um, it, that might be more feasible, but um, this is prohibitively expensive to incorporate into this project um, at this time due to the bridge's length and the complexity of the rail crossings. So that's this movement one and three. For movement two, um, and so, sorry, let me get my bearings. So for movement two, um, the key challenges were the merges and diverges um, along the section, as well as the width of the section on the bridge structure and the elevation changes. So with movement two, we end up having several merge and diverge situations um, where people biking are forced to cross the vehicle path of travel. And due to the physical geometric constraints, we're unable to provide a safe crossing without major improvements. Um, and so in addition, there's limited sight distance as you go up and over due to the grade changes in the curvature. And so this really um, wants to be a protected intersection of, or a protected bike facility, but due to the bridge width, we're unable to provide that protected facility without creating um, some potential difficulties in an emergency. So if we did take that, we would be removing the shoulder. Um, and if we remove the shoulder, then if there is an emergency situation, um, an emergency vehicle may not be able to access that portion um, in time or in adequate time. Um, and so we're limited in that way also. There may be, I do want to also highlight, there may be options for other improvements that come as part of future projects. And I think continuing to hear that this is really important is something that's definitely going to be taken into consideration um, as we look at other plans. Um, but for the scope of this project, uh, we were unable to really dig into um, improvements that would include lane reductions or that would be prohibitively too expensive to implement because it's not feasible for the project at this time. Um, for this uh, movement number six, um, we again are getting into some pinch points um, as well as, and I can flip through this a little more. Yeah, that's what, actually what I was going to ask you to pull up instead, a little easier yeah. for them to see. Yeah, so movement one, um, we have the insufficient width um, during emergency operations. Um, in addition to south of here, there's just not enough space for a bike facility. And so if we did provide a bike facility, it would just be for part, but over the bridge is a key pinch point. And then as we go to segment two, um, so this north to west, again, at the bridge is a key pinch point. And then this is also our largest change in elevation, about 30 feet, and then um, insufficient width to provide class four. And um, that, again, a similar concern about emergency operations, um, but class fours are recommended due to the limited visibility, high speeds and high volumes. And also there's a crash cushion. Movement number three um, also ties into the bridge. And so that bridge is again, that pinch point um, where we have the crash cushion, 
we have the existing bridge deck width without enough space. And then again, looking at maintaining emergency operations um, and the minimum fire clear widths is infeasible if we want to provide a protected bikeway. Section four, so going north. Um, there are, this one is complicated due to the merges and diverges in addition to the bridge width. Um, so here you come on and then we merge and merge. Um, there may be potential in the future, again, for some more complex solutions that would involve traffic impacts, um, but those are not part of the study at this time. And then section five, we are proposing a two-way cycle track to enable north-south travel through this part of the corridor. So really excited to um, include that in the proposal. And this will connect to the lanes on Brokaw. And then uh, number six, uh, this is again complicated due to the merges and diverges and then fixing those to be more comfortable crossing um, is, uh, would be prohibitively expensive um, due to the larger infrastructure changes that may be required. Sorry, that was a very long explanation. Um, Carol, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, you know, we, we also were very disappointed in terms of, you know, trying to find um, a way to add the bike lanes on these ramps, especially because a lot of them are just um, one vehicle lane. So another consideration and, and thing that we thought about was, well, what happens if you have a stalled vehicle? Um, they'll block the bike lanes. Um, another thing, um, Naomi, I don't know if you can pull up Google Earth. I, I tried to pull it up on my um, computer, but I think my internet is um, acting up, so I can't seem to show. I wanted to show um, De La Cruz and Martin. Yeah, let me get that pulled up. Give me just a moment. Can you see the Google Maps now? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we did uh, consider because we couldn't, um, you know, we wouldn't, we're not recommending adding bike lanes um, on the tri-level. And, you know, what we thought about is, well, you know, what if people do want to um, get to El Camino? How, how could they do that? right, without having to use the tri-level. So one of the things that um, we may pursue at a later time is, um, if, if you can see on the Google Maps, is you have Martin, uh, which intersects with De La Cruz. And um, so what we were considering as a alternative for now, um, because trying to add or modify the bridge would be way too expensive for the city. Um, would be um, a go around would be to use Martin Avenue, um, where it then turns into Brokaw. Um, and then as part of the Gateway uh, Crossings project, which is at um, at Coleman and Brokaw there, um, if, if you've been around the area near Costco, you will see uh, a huge development going in. Um, that project will be putting in class two bike lanes on um, on Brokaw um, west of Coleman. And then you could take the undercrossing uh, at the um, Caltrain station to get over to El Camino. Um, the only thing is um, we can't really look at anything right now as well because we have to um, meet with the city of San Jose. So the city of San Jose owns half of Martin Avenue and we own the other half. So I have tried to reach out to San Jose to see if we could even possibly put in class two bike lanes um, on the facility. 
Um, I think our bike plan calls for class two buffered, um, but that would require removal of parking. And so we would definitely need to do a parking study. So we're looking into seeing if San Jose would be at all interested in um, adding in a class two on each side of the roadway on Martin, because it looks like we can do that without removing parking. So we try to come up with some options knowing that we can't put in bike lanes on the tri-level. So that was our initial thought in the short term is to see if we can install class two bike lanes on Martin, which will get you over to Brokaw. And then if you take um, you know, that tunnel, you could eventually get on to El Camino where we're also looking to put in class four bike lanes on El Camino as well. But thank you for your thoughts, Diane. And uh, believe me, we're we're very disappointed as well um, that we couldn't really find a, a really great solution to put bike lanes on there. Uh, Naomi, the other question was on the uh, uh, transition at Martin um, between the two and the one way. Did you wanna cover that one? Mm. Uh, yes, I would love to. Thanks, Adam. So we are looking at a range of potential intersection improvements to really make these transitions seamless and comfortable. Um, so at this point in the design, we're really starting with the cross sections to make sure um, we can get some community support and buy-in for what we're proposing along the corridors. At the intersections, we would likely use a mixture of protected intersection features or bike signals in order to help facilitate those crossings. Um, so really making bike friendly intersections and using phasing, um, signal timing to separate out conflicting movements and make the movements as comfortable as possible, um, as well as potentially, yes, some protected intersection features. And um, Carol and Adam. Yeah, I was just going to add, so in that particular location where we transition from a two-way to a one-way, the idea is the two-way is on the west side of the street, so southbound cyclists would just continue on without any change. Um, but if you're riding northbound on Dale Cruz to get to the two-way, um, we would likely look at a two-stage turn. So you travel with Dale Cruz traffic to the far side of the intersection, the northeast corner of Martin and Dale Cruz, and then you would travel across uh, Dale Cruz with the Martin Avenue traffic. So at no point are you having to make a left turn on a bike and cross all the traffic lanes and, and all that. Um, you would really have a protected movement that you could just do in, in two uh, quick quick movements to get into the cycle track. And then once you're in the cycle track, you're good to go all the way through central. So um, it actually is a, a pretty seamless connection between the two. We don't really have to worry about people biking the wrong way or, or things like that, uh, the way that this is, is set up. So um, I think it's a, it's a viable option to, to kind of think about how a, a two-way and a one-way or, or compare and contrast the two-way and one-way options in this corridor. All right, our next question. Uh, hi, this is Nadia. Um, can you hear me? Yes, hi Nadia. Yep. Mm -hmm. I also wrote you this in the Q&A, so don't get me twice. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it's a really interesting plan, very detailed. I've learned a lot from this meeting. Um, my, um, my, question slash comment pertains to section two, which isn't on Google Maps right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, my use case uses makes use of Ewart Road. Um, the reason I prefer Ewart Road for my commute, my personal commute is because uh, for about half the year, the I can't even reach the area that's being improved on Trimble because the 101 underpass on Guadalupe is flooded. So I actually use Ewart Road up to this section one, section two division at that um, technology park. Um, to bypass the part of De La Cruz that's quite uncomfortable. And I continue along Ewart Road to access the southern part of the Guadalupe Trail that's not flooded. Um, so I think you proposed a west only two direction bike lane in section two. And I don't think that would provide very good connectivity to Ewart Road. I'm wondering if you've considered that. Yeah. Um... We haven't uh, really looked at that yet. It's something we can look at. Um, definitely, I know quite a few people use this little side road. Um, 
but definitely we could probably have some type of connection so that if you still didn't feel comfortable, uh, you know, I guess depending on um, which alternative gets uh, the preferred selection, right? Because one of the alternatives is that you would have a class four on both sides of the roadway. So we don't know yet what's the preferred selection, but I'm hoping that say if, if um, alternative A, which is, you know, the class four on both sides of the roadway, would you be more willing to use De La Cruz instead of this, um, you know, other roadway? And I'll just add, you know, it is, uh, we have heard that uh, you were used by a lot of folks. So uh, definitely seems to be very common and for good reason. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the benefit of that connection is that it is tying an existing signal. So there is certainly an opportunity to access the two way on the west side, um, or even just going accessing southbound Dale Cruz. You're gonna have to cross, even if it's not the two way, even if it's just the one way, in order to get the southbound cycle track lane, uh, you would need to cross Dale Cruz. So right now it just feeds into the crosswalk. Um, so I think that's something that could be explored further as part of this project is, do we do something else to facilitate a better bike crossing there? Um, but at a minimum, it, because it is tying in the signal, uh, we are able to get cyclists across um, to uh, the west side of the Dale Cruz uh, at that signal. But um, definitely some, an opportunity for, for further design iteration at that location. Any other hands that um, might be raised? So we have a few Q and A's in the chat. And it looks like Dave just came on. I'm here if you can hear me. Yes, we can mm -hmm. hear you. Okay. So um, I just want to give you some observations and feedback. Uh, we own the building and the business at 2500 Dela Cruz and Martin Avenue, one workplace. And, you know, we've occupied that space for, I don't know, 10 or 11 years now once we made the improvements to it. And, um, you know, Dela Cruz in that patch of space in front of our building is more like a freeway than a, a regular road. And over the period of time, we have had people who have parked out there pre-COVID, we had people parking out there every day on the street. And there's probably no less than four to six sideswiped cars that have uh, been impacted. Two of them were my wife's car. So I know firsthand um, the heavy trucks that come down there, um, they do not do a good job of managing the lanes and uh, they've sideswiped cars. The, the situation between Martin Avenue turning left onto Dela Cruz uh, within the last two or three years, I've seen a tomato truck jackknife and go over on its side and another truck hauling grapes go over on its side. And, you know, I'm not sure that you've considered these, these different things, but the road is not uh, flat, you know, from the middle of the road to the side of the road, there's quite a de degree of angle. And I know that's how those trucks jackknife because they're weight shifted and they just kind of went over. In addition, we have, uh, we don't see a lot of commuters coming down that far on the road. And, you know, you've got some cyclists here who may do that. And so they may have a different opinion, but we used to have a bus stop, you know, when we, when we improved our building. We spent about $25,000 to pour concrete and for the bus stop that was there. And they finally discontinued that stop because there was no, nobody was taking the bus. Uh, not that many people uh, come in that area that, that take the bus. And so, my comments are more of a concern of safety. We had another employee that was traveling down uh, Dela Cruz and he was a little bit further down. He was in a serious accident, uh, missed work for a year, was in the hospital for like six weeks. And I don't know whether it was a collision with a car or just uneven pavement, but um, there have been issues. And um, one of the things I really liked that you guys talked about was the potential of using Martin Avenue as opposed to Dela Cruz, especially with your bypass around the, you know, the overpasses there. 
um, in my opinion, that would be a much safer uh, route for people to take rather than to continue on to Dela Cruz. Um, and uh, so, so those are just my comments. I think you need to take into consideration because the traffic is at freeway speed down there sometimes. And um, I'm not sure whether narrowing the lanes or what you plan on doing will make it any safer. Uh, if you do have, uh, you know, bike lanes there, maybe there's another way you could go down Martin and, uh, you know, turn on to Lafayette and get where you need to go uh, in, in the other direction. So I just wanted to share that feedback with you. Thank you so much. At this point in time, do we want to take one of our written comments? Mm hmm yeah, let's do that. Um, so from Mikhail, uh, the question was, will section four be representative of all the tri-level road sections? Um, we hope we were able to clarify this through our conversation earlier in detail about the tri-level. Um, and so the answer is no, section four is not representative. Um, section four was just representative of that portion that was highlighted. Um, along Coleman Avenue, just to the east of the tri-level. And then your next question was, how are the bike traffic flows intended to run in the locations where the bike lanes changes from single direction to dual direction? Um, again, hope that this was answered as we chatted with um, Diane earlier. And so again, we'll be utilizing a combination of two stage turn boxes, protected intersections and bike signals to make these crossings really seamless and comfortable for everyone. Um, let's take one more raised hand and then we can just kind of popcorn back and forth. Hi, Mark. Looks like you're still muted, Mark. So if there's a way you can take yourself off mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm Dave's brother, and just if we could bring up that slide again of uh, or Martin and Dela Cruz, a couple of things Dave didn't mention that I think I want to make sure we make you aware of. Um, the main entrance to our facility is on Dela Cruz, so uh, our employees, our customers, um, that's how they enter the building. Let's see here, if I can. So it's the corner of Martin, not Matthew Martin and Dela Cruz. Um, we're not there yet. So yeah, that's our building there. You can see the solar on the roof. But if you go down that that originally that property, there's a shared driveway um, that when the data center, if it ever goes in, um, is our main entrance and part of their entrance. And they also have another driveway, kind of, you know, I can see it on my end. Um, there's trees uh, where the vineyard is kind of there. You could see the driveway I'm uh, there. And so we have our employees and customers turning left in there, and that's always taking your life in your hands when you're turning in there. And then if they're coming from Central Expressway, trying to get the cars to slow down so we, the people can make the right turn into the main driveway is also an issue. So as bikes are coming through there, um, cars turning left in and right in are an issue. Um, as Dave said, um, pre-COVID, we had constant parking along there. We have had uh, customers and employees' cars sideswipe. But at the, the same time, too, since COVID, now track or trailers park along there. So our employees haven't been able to park out in the street, per se, because there's trailers and there's been sewer work there and they've dug it up. And um, so people, I don't know when you did your study, but in the last couple of months, we haven't really been able to park out there as much. Also, getting people back to work um, has done that. But that main entrance there is an issue for people making a left turn, seeing bicyclists come that way, or people making the right turn into our main entrance, for, um, depending how you divide it or what you do to get people in there. But as Dave said, in our 10 years, we've seen lots of accidents there, um, even things that they haven't all been reported because the police department says, well, unless there's an injury, just you know, take your names and, and do whatever. But that is a dangerous corner. As Dave said, if you look at that Martin Avenue that runs closer to the 
all that empty parking there of the uh, next to the runways that the speeds there are much less and seems like a better way for people to get from this area down to where you want to go to the Costco because it brings you all the way down there to Brokaw Road following that Martin Avenue on the backside and you're keeping people off this as Dave said almost a freeway many times vehicles coming from the Central Expressway heading uh, north on De La Cruz making that right turn on the Martin Avenue depending what the lights are doing whatever if they're trying to beat the light, whatever. I mean, cars are really going around that corner really fast. And um, it is just a dangerous intersection. We've witnessed, we've seen it. And I, too, uh, agree with Dave, the safety of bicyclists. I don't know uh, why why bicyclists would want to go there. Maybe on the other side of the road, they could do what they want. But that whole bus situation, too, not only did the bus leave because there was a lot tra less traffic, but the width of the bus which is what four or five feet and where that bus stop was, was then blocking part of that right, that uh, right lane and causing issues as well. So narrowing those lanes is going to be an issue, especially for the people trying to make that turn on the Martin Avenue. So those are just my comments. Um, and uh, I think running people to Lafayette or down Martin Avenue would be a much safer solution with, because when people are coming off central expressway or one Oh one, where they come down there, they're still going fast. They aren't, haven't gotten to this 30, 35, 40 mile speed. They're going 45 and 50 easily. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just maybe note, I, those are all very good comments. Thanks for, for raising them tonight. Um, just a couple of comments. You know, part of the reason the speeds probably feel uh, and are so high is because it's a very wide expansive roadway. Um, you know, there's a lot of lanes and there's no median and then there's the shoulders. And so part of the project um, by adding in the bike facility and the bike separation um, will reduce the overall perceived width of the roadway. And that's what studies have shown is really a big driver in speed. So if drivers feel like it's a smaller, tighter roadway where they should, they need to travel a uh, lower speed, then they'll do so. And so that is, um, you know, one, I think, potential good byproduct of a, of a bike facility is, is that lower speed. And then the other, you know, for all, you're talking about the side swipes and all that. And obviously we, we uh, want to take those very seriously when it comes to bike safety. And so that's why um, instead of looking at a, just a class two bike lane with a stripe, um, that's why we're really looking at that separation. Um, we haven't picked exactly the, the treatment for the separation, but you know, likely some sort of raised curb or, or barrier to separate the bikes um, here so that there isn't uh, you know, that infringement in the bike lane by vehicles not staying in their lane. And so um, that all, you know, that's maintaining that bike safety given this type of audio auto oriented street, I think is gonna be really critical and, and will certainly drive the design uh, for this facility. Thank you. Um... I can read through this next written comment uh, from Admin Drozek. Uh, so the comment was, can we discuss today the bikeway accommodations plan for recumbent trikes? So at this point in our design, um, this is still a planning level study. So we're not getting into our design details yet. Um, as we do work through this planning process and especially as the project goes into final design, we like to consider all mode types and all users. So bike lanes serve a number of users. So people on traditional bikes, e-bikes, recumbent bikes, sometimes scooters, maybe an occasional skateboarder. And so that is something that we consider, especially moving into those final design details um, is how can we best accommodate all types of users and everyone um, in a fair and comfortable and safe way. Um, with that, should we, um, and, and then I'll actually read one more comment. So this mm -hmm. is from Betsy Magus. So to Mark's comment, those driveways and any others like them will also be conflict points for a bike lane and for a two-way bike lane. Nobody's looking for bikes coming in the counter flow direction. Um, and so, yes, this is a concern whenever we put in bike lanes or two-way cycle tracks. Um, so in general, with the bike lanes, we will be providing some uh, form of conflict treatment at driveways. 
Um, and so this could range from dash green paint. Um, there may be signage. There's also an opportunity to install some potentially more impactful features like a raised crossing. Um, at this point in time, this is still in the planning stages. And so we're not to that level of design yet. Um, also related to that, so a two-way cycle track, um, we were really conscientious of, conscientious of where we proposed those along this corridor and as part of this project and keeping that in mind. Um, it is a concern and it is something where we want to make sure that all users are visible and we're making as safe and comfortable of an environment as we can. And so, yes, so using a range of solutions to help reduce those conflicts and then only proposing two-way cycle tracks in areas where there's a limited number of driveways so we can really um, help manage some of those conflicts. And Adam, feel free if you'd like to add any more. Awesome. Thank you. And then uh, should we take one more raised hand? Edmund, I think you're unmuted and if you can oh, speak um, away. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, one one key point I wanted to raise, um, which especially if I, uh, affects somebody on a recumbent trike, whether it's two wheels in front or two wheels behind, you're leaning back, you're not strapped in, but you're low to the ground. So um, if, if the button to get the street light to kick on is mounted where you usually put it on an island. Um, it's nearly, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for, for a, a trike rider to reach it. I've noticed that in some places, the the where the light is is on a bit of a ramp, so I can actually ride up and push the button. But otherwise, unless I'm riding with a colleague who's on a bike, who which I do when I can, to push the button, there's no way I can safely um, get off the trike push the button, then climb back on and make my way across. So in, in building these intersections, please give some consideration to how someone on a recumbent trike can access the crossing button uh, to turn the streetlights on for, to make their way to the other side. Um, other than that, as you know, trikes, um, recumbent trikes tend to have a wheel width of um, 24 to 26 inches and handlebar width up to 36 inches. So I like the five foot width there, um, but they also have a very wide turning radius. Um, and the last but not least, um, when, the, when you're using an older road that has a quite a heavy slope to the side, um, that's very awkward for a trike um, because you're on three wheels, you're leaning, and if you're in the side there, the, the wheel to the nearest to the curb is getting into the broken glass and the trash and God knows what um, that would cause a flat. So um, for all those reasons, there are you know things that can be done in designing new bikeways, I think that will accommodate trike or recumbent trikes better, particularly as they're becoming more popular among seniors or those with um, mobility limitations. So uh, just please keep that in mind. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Edmund. And yes, definitely that's something uh, we should look into and consider when we get to that design stage, especially like you said, if you're trying to cross that intersection with your bike, how you best can um, push the button. All right, we have um, one last round of written questions and answers. Um, so this is from Mikhail who noted, um, another disappointed cyclist here, I looked forward to being able to use the new passage under 101 because that would reduce my commute quite a bit versus San Tomas Creek Trail. Since I live Southwest of El Camino, the decision to not connect to Lewis Street makes this less than useful to me. Otherwise, what would be the options for connecting Lafayette and Lou or 
um, what would be the options for connecting Benton slash Lafayette instead of Lewis? <laughs> uh, sorry, what would be the options for connecting Benton Lafayette via Lafayette to Reed to De La Cruz? So yeah, I mean, common common noted regarding the challenge of of not being able to get through the tri level uh, for sure. Um, I think what uh, you know, there are plans for bicycle facilities on Lafayette, um, but there is the constraint of the uh, underpass of the rail crossing there, of course. Um, uh, so you know, I think the best. Um, Solution is if uh, if the Martin improvement that Carol mentioned uh, moves forward, um, and then providing that connection via Brokaw and the undercrossing of the Caltrain tracks, uh, which would then get you to Benton, and uh, you know, basically on Benton to your destination. Um, if the uh, improvements on uh, Dale Cruz proceed, then we would also be able to get you on Dale Cruz over to Coleman to Coleman and Brokaw, um, and then again. Um, broke on the undercrossing. So there's uh, potentially two options, one via Martin, one via Dale Cruz, um, but both would then use the Caltrain undercrossing uh, to get across. Um, you know, certainly uh, it would be great to have something through the tri-level. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's good to hear this feedback uh, and the, you know, the city can, can further consider, I think what we're finding is just the, the uh, type of infrastructure improvement necessary to get through the tri-level is, is very significant. Um, it's just something that would would need to be further considered, um, not necessarily as part of this project. Hey, Naomi, do we have anything else? So I think we're I don't see anything else. Uh, that was the end of the questions. So thank you all so much for your feedback and, and notes and questions today. Yes, we truly appreciate it. And once again, feel free to go to the project's webpage um, and please um, do that online survey and you, know, you can add more comments um, than what we heard tonight. And you could take a better look at um, all the concepts uh, within that online survey and um, provide your feedback to us. And we'll definitely take that into consideration um, as we move into the next phase of the project where we'll ultimately ask the public uh, what's their preferred alternative or it might be nothing. <laughs> so that's another option is do nothing. Um, and then of course, as Naomi said, uh, we do have a dedicated email and you can leave a voicemail at our dedicated phone number um, in case you you know have anything else to say uh, besides just what's what we have posted on the online survey. And then of course, please feel free to join us on Monday. Um, starting at four o'clock, we have our Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee meeting where we'll present um, this very similar or exact uh, PowerPoint to them where uh, you could hear our uh, Bike and Ped Advisory Committee's uh, feedback on these designs as well. And I think with that, I think we'll uh, wrap it up. And um, so I want to thank everyone again for joining us. And please feel free to check the project webpage as often as possible. I, I do post, you know, any new content on there. And especially, you know, when we'll be having our third um, online community meeting as well. So with that, I hope everyone has a great uh, evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.